Well, before we begin our debate, let's first speak to photojournalist Jeff Widener. He's the man who took this remarkable photo of an unknown protester, later called Tank Man, during the Tiananmen Square protests. He joins us now from Honolulu. Jeff, good to have you on the Newsmakers. What was going through your mind when you took that photograph? It was only about uh, a few seconds after I realized that something had gone seriously wrong. And uh, my shutter speed was way too slow. And by the time I figured it out, the man had been whisked away. And frankly, it was a miracle that picture came out. What were your thoughts about the man and in the years after when we didn't really know what happened to him? Tell, tell me your thoughts about him. It was really an incredible feat what he did. But you got to understand that at the time, I was suffering from the flu. In fact, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of comical because I'm suffering from a bit from the flu right now. But um, at the time, I was injured. Uh, I was hit in the face of the rock from, uh, during a burning armored car incident. So when I was leaning over the balcony taking the photograph, um, it, it just, you know, at the time, I was just so scared. I really wasn't thinking too much about what was happening except getting that picture in focus. Without that picture, what conversation would the world be having about Tiananmen now, 30 years later? That's an interesting question. I'm really not sure what uh, the, the topic and the tempo would be on that. Uh, I think you'd still have a lot of people every year in Hong Kong lighting candles. Um, and I think that um, there would be less articles uh, every anniversary time. I think the tank man just galvanizes the whole story and the situation uh, very easily. I mean, no one knows who he is. He's like the unknown soldier. And uh, the mystery grows, uh, you know, as the years go by. If you didn't have your camera with you and you had to report back in a sentence or two what you saw and what you experienced there in Tiananmen, what would that be? Well, you know, one of the things that amazed me was when I first arrived, there was almost a carnival atmosphere at the Tiananmen Square with the students. There was this lightness, you know, this, this uh, wonderful f feeling in the air. You, uh, everyone uh, was happy. Um, it was well organized. You had students with mechanical printing presses. Um, I, I was amazed that every morning I would arrive, they were building the goddess of democracy, which was basically a replica of the Statue of Liberty. And it was facing right across from the great Mao portrait, you know, which symbolizes communism. And I think a lot of the reporters got wrapped up in this whole thing. How amazing this is. Is it really possible that China could be converting to democracy? And uh, I think that's what was going through my mind most of the time. Right. In many ways, Jeff, it's almost impossible for protesters in China to organize to get to that level of protest in the squares these days because of social media and because of the government choking the Internet and uh, tools of communications and so on. So with that in mind, how would you compare the situation now in 2019 to 1989? I don't think things are getting any better um, as far as freedom of press. Uh, I think that, um, you know, it, it really is up to the Chinese people to decide what they want in their country. And talking about the symbolism of your photograph, does it transcend beyond the borders of China, the man and the tank? I think it's universal if they understand what happened. A lot of students think there's a parade going on or they haven't seen the photo and they're not sure what's going on. Um, and it really is um, a, a wide gap going on right now. There's a, a lot of folks from older generations that immediately recognize the picture. And there's a lot of younger photo, uh, uh, people that uh, can relate and understand that photo. I did a um, talk at Ohio University um, not too long ago. And at the end of my talk, a Chinese uh, woman came up to me, a student, Chinese student, and she said, Mr. Widener, I just want to thank you for showing me this because I never knew this happened in my country. Mm. Right, that's fascinating. Jeff Widener, good to have you on the Newsmakers. Thank you very much for joining us. Let's bring in our panel now. Chinese dissident Weir Kaishi was one of the student leaders during the Tiananmen Square demonstrations. He joins us from London. In Beijing, we have China affairs analyst Xu Kinduo. And King Wa Fu is an associate professor at the University of Hong Kong's Journalism and Media Studies Center. He joins us now from Boston. Xu, I had a different question lined up for you initially, but after what I heard from Jeff, I want to pose that to you. He said that Chinese, young Chinese people coming up to him and saying, I didn't even know this happened in my country. 
which is testament to the fact that China has covered this up. It's erased the history of what happened at Tiananmen. Isn't that an embarrassment to the country? Obviously, this uh, event was not taught in the Chinese uh, like a history textbooks. Uh, I would say most of the young people, I would say they are aware of the incident. Uh, pro probably there are individuals who have never heard of that or who have never seen that picture. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, but again, you know, if you uh, see the Chinese government is trying to cover this incident, uh, but I think it's uh, politically, culturally, uh, the Chinese uh, stress very much about harmony uh, rather than discord, stress very much about the unity rather than confrontation or division. Uh, so that's a culture. And also, uh, people like to remember, uh, you know, uh, something positive, what happened in the past, instead of something tragedy, probably. Uh, and I think it has something to do with that. Okay, but we also hear about the rape of Nanking and other things, so I don't know how that squares. What does the Chinese government fear by letting their people know what happened 30 years ago? Oh, I don't think the Chinese government is, fears anything uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the country's development. Look, I think there are a lot of priorities, current priority uh, facing the Chinese government. For example, the creation of jobs, uh, the looming, uh, you know, trade war looming large with the United States, and also, you know, how to manage the economy to continue to grow. So people have the jobs, people continue to have the living standard improved. That's a more, more challenging situation, more okay. challenging jobs for Chinese leadership, rather than, say, spending time probably like to talk more about what happened 30 years ago, I guess. Where, Kaishi, you were there 30 years ago. You're clearly not in China at the moment. Firstly, tell us why you're in London and whether or what it would be like if you tried to go back to China. And secondly, address Xu Kindo's point that, well, the focus is on harmony and there are other priorities for China right now. They don't want to talk about <clears throat> Tiananmen. Thank you very much uh, for having me here. Yes, I'm here in uh, London uh, uh, in revealing, uh, premiering a film about Liu Xiaobo and going to L Oxford Union to take part in a panel to talk about Tiananmen. Uh, the fact China banned words about Tiananmen, about June 4th, is undeniable. It's not culture, it's propaganda. In our culture, in the culture of Chinese uh, 5,000 years of history, 4,000 years of history, cover up was never part of the Chinese culture. Let's not use the word culture just to, to uh, uh, alienate China from uh, the rest of the world. We are all the same. We want to hear the truth. We want our freedom. It's not like, okay, we have a priority to get our stomach feet so that we don't care about our freedom. That, if you call it the Chinese culture, I think a billion people, if you give them an opportunity to speak up, they will dispute that very much. And then in 1989, we did dispute that. In the year, in the 80, uh, uh, in the decade of 1980s, Chinese uh, situation was getting better. Yes, uh, because it was in such a low point at the end of the 70s. Uh, in the Cultural Revolution. So in the 80s, any of the reform and then the opening up, that's the slogan of the uh, Deng Xiaoping introduced at that time, yes, brought prosperity and hope for China. At that time, when people were uh, thinking, you know, tomorrow is going to be better than today, and today was already better than yesterday. So that has been, you know, Chinese people's demand for more and op more open up. And at, yet this, at the same time, every single year during the 80s, there were student demonstrations. I think that is also an undeniable fact. Those student demonstrations was against Chinese government's propaganda on, you know, let us just feed you. Be quiet about political opinions. So the yeah. country is trying to tell us, you know, we, if we can feed you, then you should be shut up. It's, a, it's like a pig farming culture. That is certainly not a culture of Chinese. That would be an insult to the, to the concept of Chinese culture. When I did an internet search and I went onto Wikipedia, you featured in the Wikipedia entry on Tiananmen. You were one of the top names there. Can you go back? Would, would something happen to you if you actually went back home? Well, uh, number, uh, I'm still most wanted by the Chinese uh, government's uh, you know, uh, definition. And uh, 
by the world China, most wanted, it is supposed to want me. And I turned myself back to the Chinese regime four times through different channels, and then all rejected. Why? They wouldn't let me turn myself in. Because, well, uh, the uh, Chinese government is afraid of dialogue. You know what? In Chinese in Chinese culture, back in Tang Dynasty or Han Dynasty, government never refused dialogue. So again, refusing dialogue is not a culture okay. thing. Okay. I want to so, bring in King. Okay. I want to bring in King Wafu. King Wafu, you want to come in? First, I would wish to comment on the priority issue first. So, what I my take is that Chinese Communist Party basically has long history of making worse mistakes including cultural revolution, great, great leap uh, forward. So all of these, like uh, Tiananmen Square crackdown, are still political sensitive in China up to now. So the party doesn't want to really face the history and really learn from the mistakes. So because the reflection itself is a threat to the, spree, uh, to the, to the uh, state stability, and of course, also a threat to the leader's rest interest. So from his perspective, it's not really surprising to me that the party continue to suppress public discussion on Tiananmen Square crackdown. Are they discussing oh, it, King Wafu? Because as far as I understand, you've been able to tap into some of the conversation that's been banned within the borders of China. Give us some insight into that. Okay, correct. Uh, even after 30 years, basically Tiananmen Square crackdown is still a political sensitive issue. This is what we know. The, uh, the, uh, the authority continuously suppress activity and the public speech. But on the social media, we found evidence that many posts that were made by the Chinese netizen in different forms to commemorate the June 4th, including making a candle night photo, uh, creating a emojis, uh, posting a variety form of a uh, Jeff Tangman picture. That's back to the question and talk about the symbolis uh, uh, as, uh, symbolism. There's a lot of different, we, we found more than two dozen mm -hmm. different variety of Tangman pictures circulating on uh, uh, social media, including uh, writing a poem. This is people using different form to discuss about the issue. So even though all of these were eventually censored, but they managed to survive in the public domain for, say, a few hours' time. But that already generates a certain extent of impact. This is a very strong evidence that the event is not for forgotten by the Chinese people. Xu Kenduo, it's not forgotten by the Chinese people, so why doesn't the government tap into that? Because maybe there'll be an opportunity for healing then. See, the government has learned, uh, uh, you know, like a, you know, from the government perspective, I guess they would love to, you know, handle the event uh, differently in terms of uh, uh, how to handle such a kind of issue, like, um, you know, occupy uh, Wall Street, like a uh, yellow vest, uh, or yellow vest movement in the Paris. It's really about the technical issue in a sense. It plays an important role. And the second, I think the government has learned a lesson from this tragedy, that is, you know, uh, stability. Uh, is a priority. Without a stability, there's no development. If you look at the past 40 years, if you look at the great achievement, China is a, now is from a poor country to the second largest economy. Uh, I don't agree right. with uh, you know but, the attitude to you, dismiss. But, the but China. You, that was that was based on the government's own definition of the people being counter-revolutionaries, right? Who's to say that the country couldn't have been still stable, but China would not have massacred? those people on the streets. I mean, ultimately, what you're saying is that 30 years down the road, they're looking at it as saying, this is a lesson that we should never, ever allow any form of democracy ever again because we don't want to deal with it. Is that No, if you, if you look at the, if you look at the like Chinese it. people compared to 30 years ago, obviously, the people with uh, the spread of uh, social media, the people have obviously more freedom I mean, in terms of like, where you, you live, in terms of finding a job, et cetera. Uh, if you look at the people's uh, attitudes towards, uh, say, approval rate of the government, uh, then by Ipsos, I think that's a yearly uh, survey. For example, like 86 to 7 percent of the, of the public, uh, they are supportive of the government. They think their country is on the right track to the future. And if you look back in 1989, you know, uh, I just talked to a few students actually and, you know, participated in the event. At the very beginning, you see, there's uh, this oh, activity they call the profiteering or speculation. People are not happy with that. They call it in Chinese word, guan dao dao ye. So people 
uh, you know, stood up and uh, took to the streets. I think that's right, you know, that they're right. And also some students, uh, you know, also think why my professor is making less money uh, than, say, uh, a barber in a barber shop. Uh, they think there is a lack of fairness in society. So that's the very beginning. Uh, gradually now, you know, people call it like, uh, you, know, uh, the, you know, people are asking or we're asking uh, democracy and freedom. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a gradual development. It developed, it lasted for uh, almost two months. Uh, so that's a situation, you know, with the chaos. And How then can it was, deal with no, that? No, but situation? then it was crushed. I, think right. it's a, I mean, there's no, there's no evidence that they had any weapons. There's no evidence that they did any harm towards the police or the, or the, arm, the army initially. Let's ask, you said you were speaking that's, to some of the students. I, okay. That's what I said. Okay. That's what I said. Like, they could have done it much better in oh, a better way. Okay, so let's ask somebody who was there. Where Kaishi? You could have done it much better and prevented it. Go ahead. Well, uh, Professor Xu, uh, I, I think I got your name there. You talked about approval rate. That's very interesting. Approval rate of Chinese people to the Chinese government. It doesn't make any sense in a country that does not have free flow of information to talk about approval rate. Well, if you want to talk about it, you know what? North Korea has a much higher approval rate of the leadership. No, you say North Korea, no, you're wrong. It's North done Korea by does have... The French company is not done by exactly, the Chinese government. But it, it, no, I'm not saying it's Chinese. I'm talking about Chinese society that does not uh, af, uh, allow free flow of information. Are you going to argue about well, that? I would argue uh, freedom has its limit. In different societies, yeah. probably, people see it differently. And also, you have to respect the every country Do you think have their you sovereign don't deserve rights. A right? They manage their economy. They manage their society. Do you think you don't deserve they did a, a right they did vote? A job, people are happy with that. And uh, if they've done a bad job, people are not North happy Korea with that. North Korea are not happy? I think, think people, so? That's clear. Sorry? You think North Korean people are happy, happier? Oh, I've never been North there. Korea. I have no idea whether they're happy or not. Yo, you have to agree with them uh, to, to support your judge point. upon North Korea. I, and Are I would saying, be that crazy to compare China to North Korea. Well, the same one thing that's comparable is that the both countries control information flow. You're not going to deny that, are you? Well, in terms of control information uh, flow, do you think there is absolute freedom? In well, London, uh, in what Washington, is, okay. So there's Give a no whatever control percentage for information. You think, what is the percentage of freedom you think it's appropriate? No, and then I, it's I, a, I, no like, don't use the word absolute like, to deny like a general is, it's freedom. It's easier to talk about uh, the, you know, in abstract sense, talk about democracy, freedom. Of course, it's good, but put them into reality. It's a long yeah. process. And let me it's it okay, reality. but let okay. So let me let reality. me jump in here. Shoot, shoot, shoot. Okay. You deserve okay. Hold on, hold on, gentlemen. Just, just, just give me a second here. I, the, just I give me a second here because Shu Kendo was saying that it's a process, right? Let me bring in somebody who's actually protesting right now, an activist who says, "Well, that process hasn't uh, borne any fruits." Have a have a little listen to this. The students back then were opposing corruption, but now things are more serious than in 1989. There is now the abuse of power, destruction of churches, Buddha statues, and it seems to be going back towards the Cultural Revolution. That was Chu Yu Ming. So, Xu Kindua, where's the evidence totally that China, but where's the evidence that China has been opening up gradually, gradually, gradually towards? Democracy let, let when 30 years on, we can't even if talk you, about Tiananmen. Yes, yes, I have the evidence. If you bother to check the number of the people who have religious practice in China, it's 10 times, maybe 11 times that 30 years ago. That's the progress. That's a hard evidence of a progress. If there's a problem, of course, in any country there's a problem. If there's, a, you know, a, the, the, the people you interviewed mentioned about uh, say so-called crackdown on the religion. For example, it only happened in Zhejiang province, in one of the uh, cities of Zhejiang province. Uh, they have their clear regulation. Okay. If there are some violation of the regulation, then there's a problem. Okay. There's a conf okay. confrontation. I want to bring in King Wafu. The government okay. and the local Okay, yeah. let's go to Hong Kong. King Wafu, come in. Uh, may I say a few words about the proof of way, basically, because in the uh, academia, basically, we are pretty skeptical 
to the uh, opinion poll in the authoritarian country because the people usually uh, has the fear to really speak about their real opinion through using the telephone interview. So that that is one thing I, I think people need to bear in mind. Second point is if you I I, I don't have to think as how many people are attending church and religion in China, but I I I I begin find increasingly more missionary or uh, uh, people participating in church, a foreign going people get arrest okay. and at the end in, in China. So I, I don't see really we can see one single figure, so you can see really China is okay. really opening up. Okay, where Kaishi, my final question to you, big picture. Beyond Tiananmen, I know Tiananmen's usually considered one of the three T's. Tiananmen, Tibet, Taiwan, the three, three things you don't talk about. Let us add Xinjiang and the issue of the Uyghurs and possible concentration camps over there. Big picture, tell me how you see China right now in the year 2019 when it comes to the freedom of the human beings within its borders. 30 years ago, Chinese government took a drastic part for, uh, uh, turn from opening and reform with its bloody, brutal massacre to the peaceful demonst petitioners in Tiananmen Square, and then to 30 years of the, uh, uh, change in that direction. Today, China is one of the worst total totalitarian regime that kills freedoms, that uh, uh, and eliminates uh, religious freedom, uh, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly. All those people who challenge on those fronts get arrested. Even those just people who have the identity of being a Uyghur, you know, just it's something they were born with. They cannot do anything about it. They are put into a concentration camp. China today is one of the worst source of the global harmony, universal, universal value. And then it's a threat to the modern day civilization. And for that, I think I blame mostly, of course, to Chinese regime, but also the Western democracies, the so-called, and the global citizens today under stress also take a piece of blame and then a piece of responsibility uh -huh. to restore China to the civilized, opening up reform direction. Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure having you on the Newsmakers. We are Kaishi, Shu Kinduo, and King Wafu. Thanks for joining us.